Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and it is posted on our website for you to watch later. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do spread the word, share with anyone you think might be interested in any of the shows we have on um, Encompass Live. Uh, the, for those of you not from Nebraska, um, the Nebraska Library Commission, uh, we are the state, state library for um, Nebraska, um, state library agency. So we provide services and training to all types of libraries. So you should find shows um, um, on our schedule and in our archives for anybody. Um, public, K-12, academic, corrections, museums, archives, historical societies, uh, we've had everything on the show. <laughs> um, and we do a mixture of things here, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. We do bring in guest speakers from um, all across the country, if sometimes, but we also have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations for us. And that's what we have today. Today with us is um, Amanda Sweet. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. She is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, and normally we, we kind of have a mishmash of things today. Um, normally she does a monthly session for us called Pretty Sweet Tech. Uh, it's usually the last Wednesday of the month. Um, she is here today, not really doing a pretty sweet tech, but doing part four of a special series she's been doing on teaching technology in the library. Um, today, talking about marking and evaluation your tech. Um, the three previous sessions were done, one earlier this month and two last month. All the recordings are available already up on our page. If you looked at today's session page, the three recordings are there, so you can always watch any, the three of those at you, when you want to. And when this one is done, we'll have all four recordings up for um, your um, perusal as well. Um, but I will hand it over to Amanda now to uh, talk us all about how to do good marketing. Sweet. Yeah. All right. So. First up, we're going to talk about more or less marketing 101. So I never know what the ex background experience or personal experience of the listeners are in these things. So it kind of runs the gamut every time. So I don't want to cover things, jump way ahead for people that are just getting started, might be new. And then I'll go over how to start incorporating some of the user experience research and some of the different techniques that we've used throughout this teaching technology course. And I'll also kind of give a review just in case this, this is the first session that you're attending of this teaching technology course. This will be your primer and entry point into this so you can jump back into the sections that you want to visit or need as you go along. And then I'll wrap it all out with the evaluation resources. Um, I won't dig too deep into specifics and evaluation right now because it's incredibly difficult to do that without an actual project in front of me. Um, as you go through the course, you'll actually have the stuff in front of you, and you can also reach out to me and ask as you go along. Um, let me jump into this. So this is the review of what we've already gone over so far. Um, the previous three sessions in this teaching technology webinar, it kind of went over into some user experience research methods to dig into who's like who you're actually trying to connect to, who are you trying to reach? What is their daily life like? What are they, how are they living every day? And are you actually designing tools, services, and resources that fit the flow of everyday life? Or are you designing resources that's just easier for the library to do? Because that's also, I mean, it's, it's easier to do. And it's sometimes it's the only thing we have the resources to do. So that's what happens even if it doesn't work for people. So that just kind of roots you into reality. And then the what's the problem section of it will dig into expanding out the pool of what you could be focusing on. You'll do a deep dive into 
the problems people are facing on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, and start prioritizing what is most important to people. The more important a problem is and the better you market and phrase it to the public, the more likely they are to use your services and you can start rebranding the library so that you are tackling different technology needs if that's not something that you already do. And in this third section of the course, we, di we dig into different ways that the library can actually connect people with this stuff. Are you going to use a workshop? Are you doing one-on-one -on -one training? Um, are you going to rethink the reference interview? Do what you've always done because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And are you going? <laughs> and are you going to go into? There's just like a little motley assortment of ways that you can start digging into that. Um, the community conversation is one of the most popular ones right now, and it is ever expanding. Um, there's a menu of resources available in there if you want to dig into it and explore what works for you. And then the gather resources will help you with the different tools, tips, and techniques to be able to collect together what's missing so that you can actually get this third section done. And there's also some techniques to broaden your horizons and trying to build partnerships. And there's also a partnership resource map so that you get an understanding of what building a partnership looks like if that's new for you. And there are a variety of resources available for that. And the preparing staff is the number one excuse or reason that I get that none of this other stuff happens is we don't have time. That's not a priority for us right now. So if you don't have time, this pre the prepare staff has some time management resources some project management resources and a variety of ways to find time when you never thought you had time before. And this can either be temporary changes, long term changes or just enough to get the job done at the time. And what we're talking about now is how to let people know that you exist once you've actually started putting this service together. So how do you let people know that you are now tackling problems that you didn't tackle before? And how do you let people know that you are connecting with people in new and different ways and that it's not the same thing that you've always done before? Or you're just adding something new to what you've done. And then how do you evaluate it to make sure that what you just tried actually did the trick? All right, so this is kind of your marketing 101 primer here. So basically our main goal in the library is to provide the things that people actually need in their lives. You found out what the problem is. Now you're trying to let people know that you exist. There's kind of a main primer as to what all marketing tools should actually have. And that is essentially that you're giving people a call to action. Um, I used to write um, content for websites. Um, I, I actually worked for a skydiving company. That was kind of funny. But so the main, their main thing was call to action. You have to have a brief statement that is 10 words or less on a website at the end of a content section that lets people know exactly what you want them to do. And there's a click through button or resource pack that allows them to easily navigate the sign up process. Uh, one of the main things that libraries tend to run into is they use a, a PDF download and scan and print sign up form because they were incredibly popular. They used to be one of the only ways that it could be done. So that's still carried on in a lot of different libraries. But when you have a website and you say, let me click open this example here. Say that you're doing, this is a marketing flyer that I put together in Canva. Let's say that you want to tell people that you are doing a digitization event. So this would be kind of a little blurb that gets people's attention. It's saying, this is something people care about. This is what they want in their lives. Never forget where you came from. This is what you are doing. And this digitize what matters is what they would be going to your event for. This is who is leading the event. And this is what it is, an archiving workshop. And a lot of times we start with the archiving workshop and say, come to our archiving workshop. It's this. August 25th, people read that and say, I don't know what that is. I'm not a librarian. I'm not going to that. But this is just kind of a clear action 
that people can do, gets the attention, and there's a click-through registration form. So when, you're do, when you are trying to incorporate user experience into this, what you want to start doing is to make sure that the full sign-up to registration to reminder is clear. Because you click through to this registration button, where does it go? Does it download a page? Does it go to an online form? Does it go to a form embedded into a website? And how are people reminded that this exists? So Krista sent out the confirmation emails and sends out the reminder emails that these webinars exist. You probably remembered that this webinar existed because you actually got a confirmation that says, hey, remember you signed up for this thing like a month ago. It's tomorrow. Come on by. And that's what you want. <laughs> so that is your user experience flow. You see the ad, you click the thing, and you get the you go directly to a sign up form, fill it out, get the confirmation email so that you have the immediate reminder and verification. And then time passes. You get the reminder email that is hopefully automated within your system, and then they show up. You can increase retention rate and attendance. So this is a print version of this, but I also have, oh, did I not put that in here? I will open it separately because it is nice to have. I'm gonna go into my downloads. And I will grab this one. So on your screen, do you see the same version, but with a different little sign up form in the corner? Yes, with a QR code. Okay. So this is actually for a print version. So in a lot of coffee shops and different events or different, um, I've even seen these out in like little club areas. And I go to a coffee shop called The Foundry and there are a bunch of little print flyers about local events. Mm -hmm. But I kept thinking, I have no way of actually getting to the event page. I get back to the, I get back to work and I forget that the thing existed. I don't memorize a full URL, so I may have looked at the URL at the bottom of the flyer, but it's stuck in the bottom of my purse right now. But with this QR code, it's an immediate action that you can take. And there's a little instruction that I inserted on the, on the bottom here in case QR codes are new. It just says, sign up, that's your call to action. Scan with your camera app. That's the mini instruction for how to do it. Then they pull out a smartphone, scan it, and you can shoot it directly over to your sign up form. And this is just a slightly different way of doing the registration button. And you can also increase sign up and retention because you don't lose people because they didn't memorize a URL or they lost your flyer in the bottom of, her, of a purse, which I do a lot. Not gonna lie, I do that a lot. <laughs> I've seen it on, I've seen there's on the side of a, a food trucks, I've seen you, you know, we, because food trucks move around in your community in yeah. the city. And they say, you wanna know our schedule? We're gonna next be here, scan the QR code and you can always check up on what we're doing. And restaurants do it a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and tabletop ads are also a really popular option right now. Mm -hmm. So if you just tuck a little QR code in the tabletop ad, you're good to go. And you can do these in different colors and different frames and there's a QR code generator. And I'll actually link over to the QR code generator that I used to make this happen. Let me grab it. It's right on top of my list here. Yeah, I'm sure that's some people's first question is how? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's actually what took me forever to put together these resources is because I'm putting together like the little resource list and resource pack that'll show you how to do each one of these individual things. Mm -hmm. And, but just for now, because I mentioned it, code generator is in the in this in the chat okay. 
So this is kind of a fun flyer that you can also use. So this is another example of that attention grabber because this is one of the things that people really want to know. This mm -hmm. is on their mind all the time, everywhere. This is just a really quick blurb about what they're going to be doing, the credibility and the credentials of the person who's going to be leading it. If you're going to learn about child safety, a teacher is a wonderful way to do it. A librarian is a wonderful way to do it. People who work with kids and are care about your kids and care about their safety, and they are leading an in-person talk, and they you will have a resource and guidebook at the end of it. Because people want to know, OK, if I go to this thing, how am I going to remember that this stuff existed? And then there's just a quick detail, and then you can add another button for a registration link that'll click through to one of those forms. And a teddy bear with a cell phone is just kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just one more example. You can kind of glance at it and start, and instead of me telling you, you can start thinking about where is your attention grabber? What do I want people to do? When is it? Where is it? And there's one thing that's missing on here. I'll give you a second to think about it, then I'll tell you. How do you know what to do? How do you take action on this? Go to the library on Wednesdays in June. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> How often do you see a flyer like this and forget you saw it? You say, oh, cool, the library is offering this right now, but where's your registration button? Where's your little click through? And this is one of the, com the most common types of flyers that I see out there. It takes you 90% of the way, but it misses that one little registration button. Or that one little call or to information action. about what to do. I mean, maybe yeah. it is a yeah. <clears throat> on the fly, just come in or yeah. type thing. You know, you need something that says a little bit more. What's my next step? Yeah. <clears throat> whatever, whether it is registering or just showing up or whatever. Yeah. And I've also seen a get more information button. Sure. Yep. And what you're doing, yeah. Because some people want to know, well, is this Microsoft Office for beginners? Is this Microsoft Office for intermediate? Do you offer different levels? Uh, how can I do this? So this, 90% of the way. Take it through other 10. So this is actually advertising the library itself. So this is just kind of a catchy, splashy image. This can go on to social media, it can go on to, this is actually like a little open book journal and it has a little fantasy scene inside. That's and an awesome graph picture, yes. <laughs> and this was actually just from Pixabay. It's a mm -hmm. free graphic that was just popped right in there. I used Canva to make it. Canva is a free tool that you can use to make any of these different advertising flyers. All of the flyers that are on here were made in Canva. And I just customized different templates. Some of them were switched up a little more than others. And you can also download some, I grabbed some new buttons and they customized a button that was put into here. But Canva is the place to go. I and, this is, yes. and this is the last kind of major example I'll go through which is shift up your phrasing a lot and say, because how often do you read a life? But when you check out a biography, what are you doing? So if you start just kind of shifting things on their axis and combining things with different catchy images, that's all you really have to do. This took maybe about less than five minutes for me to put together and download. And there it is. So if you are looking for kind of a little checklist of what does my marketing actually have to have, what should I look for in good marketing? 
eye-catching graphics is one of the number one things. Um, there used to be a time when words were the way to go. You wanted to add as much information as you could, but as the internet grew up and was able to support more graphics, it shifted over to graphics are the number one thing. And try to actually reflect what matters to people in your phrasing. And that is why we started out with never forget where you came from, because this is this is what people care about. This is what I'm talking about when I go into all this user experience stuff, because you want to connect the entire thing together with people's values. You uncovered a value during user experience research. Now you want to reflect that value and pull people in based on what they care about and what matters to them. And remember, you're not predatory for doing this. A lot of marketing the, a lot of marketing will play on values and they are predatory for doing so because they want to manipulate behavior. But you're not charging for anything and you're also, you're trying to actually help people. So there's a difference between playing on emotion and feeling for predatory nature and playing on emotion and feeling to, to connect people with the things they actually need. So there's kind of like that fine line in marketing where Facebook can use a series of stories that will pull people in and say, you need Facebook because we're gonna keep you healthy, safe, and well. But then in practice, they're keeping people cracked out and addicted. And it's, but it also depends on how you use Facebook. It does. It, it, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the major debates that's going on right now is, is marketing ethical right now? People are learning the user experience stuff, but how are you going to use it? What do you stand for? And that's why the other thing is you're branding the library. Mm -hmm. Your marketing is a representation of what the library stands for. So how do you want people to view the library? And how do you want people to think about what you stand for? Do you want people to think about you like Facebook? And how do you want you to how people how do you want people to think about you like Facebook? Facebook can be good, bad, library can be boring, awesome. Start talking about it. Uh, let me grab this little document here that I don't think I pulled in. And by the way, I'm not saying Facebook is evil. My dad's on Facebook like all the time. He uses it in a good way. But so this is kind of the, I adapted this from the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. Um, I added a few things, pulled a few things out, reorganized things and popped it into this handy dandy graphic. So when you are trying to start out in getting marketing that works, this is kind of a little format that has been tried and true that people have been doing and adapting for quite a while. So, and you've already done it if you've been working along with the teaching technology course so far. This beginning section where you are looking into figuring out who your audience is, that was what you did when you're trying to figure out what the problem was and why people care about stuff. You did that already. And when you're trying to figure out your products and services, what are you actually marketing? This is that how do people learn section. This is, am I going to be doing a workshop? Am I going to be partnering with people? And I'm marketing a new network of resources. This is how do people learn and partnering. And in the partnering and competition section, you're finding out who else is also offering this stuff? How do they market it? How do they approach it? What are they doing with it? You've, you are already 90% of the way once you've gotten to the marketing section. You've already vetted out your partners that are working in this space. You already know who is, if you're going to be doing a section on Microsoft Office, you might know who's doing the certification process. You might know about local businesses that actually want people to learn their stuff. You might know about um, job training and other alternative certification methods and processes for learning this stuff. So you've already uncovered a lot of this information and you've also uncovered 
things like GCF Learn that might either be a competition or a partner. That can be both. Mm -hmm. um, online learning is partially a competition, but it's also a complement. And so in your marketing goals, you would want to start including in how do you want people to view the library? What do you actually want to get out of this marketing effort? Do you want to increase attendance by 10%? Um, do you want to increase web activity? Do you want to um, increase the duration of time people spend on certain websites? Um, do you want to in like increase engagement? Do you want more feedback? What do you actually want to get out of this? Because if you send out a marketing plan and you later want to evaluate it, you need a metric that you're working off of that says, did we achieve it? Did we not achieve it? And how are we going to measure that? So the methods is actually what's been taking me forever in getting these resources together. There's just so, so many. <laughs> right? Yeah. So the methods is the most popular one right now and probably, yeah, it's probably the most popular is social media. So going out, putting out that Facebook ad, putting out the Twitter ad, but then diversifying because not everyone's on Facebook, not mm -hmm. everyone's on Twitter, not everyone wants to click through and sign up for an event using a social media platform. There's trust issues. There's just people who don't want to deal with it. Some people love it. So it just kind of, you have to do it in different ways. And this is also the methods part of it is going to tie directly into who your audience is. Choosing a social media platform is going to depend on the average age of the audience, um, where people in your community already, um, already are, um, how difficult would it be for the library to actually start leveraging that resource. And I put in some different resources for how to um, choose a different social media platform, how to start making the actual graphics that will go into it. Um, Canva is basically your number one source. It has basically every template that you could ever need or want. And if you are starting to go into more creative routes, like using a tabletop marketing ad, I put in some templates that you can use for that. Um, you can go through Vistaprint. There's a template that you can use and they just print it all and mail it off to you. Okay. And you can also, um, Avery Labels has a series of templates that's basically like a drag and drop. So okay. if you're making your own stickers or buttons or labels, you can use their pre-made templates and basically just pop your graphic in there add a little text and then send it off to the printer. And you can buy the print labels or the off-brand print labels that are compatible and you can print it in-house or send it off somewhere to get done. And let me grab the little table that I'm actually putting together right now so you can get an idea of the resources that are going to be mailed, made available by the at least the end of today. It has taken a minute. <laughs> So let me grab those resources just to give you a visual here. Uh, da, 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 da. That is in my tab that I'm in right now. So this is a running list that I've got so far. Do you see this table? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let me blow this up a little bit. So on the left-hand side here is kind of your concept idea, the format for the marketing. Then I'm putting together a series of resources that are, that'll kind of give you a guide and tutorial for how to actually do it. And then there's a set of online tools that will help you do the thing. So a lot of these tools are either template-based or guided tutorial-based. You'll see Canva popping up a lot in here and Adobe Spark, and you'll see a lot of the same similar things. But each one of these links on the right-hand side is unique. So this Canva link will send you directly over to the social, the canvas of her social media. Um, it's gonna make me go in here. So this will send you over to Canva for social media. This will send you to Canva with a tutorial for email. 
this will send you to Canva with a guide for flyers. And there's also a set of, there's a lot, there are so many ultimate guides. <laughs> and so many of them that I sifted through were not great, but I picked the ones that kind of made the most sense and followed the best marketing guidelines as far as I know them. If you know a better one, send them my way, please. Mm -hmm. So, and these are the ones that I am adding now. So this is what's missing here. But other so, things you could be doing, yeah. yeah. And so these are the one that I actually want to try personally for my tech kits coming up is the activity spinning wheel. So the activity spinning wheel is basically, it's like a physical little spin mm -hmm. wheel. And then it has, it find, you find out which activity you land on inside the wheel, pop it off, and then try your tutorial right then and there. Yeah. And it's kind of because the biggest thing people have troubles with in like a maker space or trying to do a tutorial is, what should I do? Yeah, what am I going to make? I mean, I, yeah. I need ideas. I don't know what to, how to, what to, if you don't have an idea already about how to use it, you need yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Just show me what I can do. And then maybe my head will go, oh, now yep. I can actually do this thing that I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't and realize this, do. <laughs> right. And with the spinning wheel, that's just kind of like a fun way to put the little labels right in front of people. Some people look at the spinning wheel and they go, I want to do pie section eight and they're just <laughs> good to go. And other people want to give it a spin, see where it lands and grab it off of there. And not going to lie, it's kind of hard to find a good tutorial on a spinning wheel. I know how to make them, but I'm trying to find a good tutorial on them. Hmm. And I might have to adapt something. And then the other thing is the branded products and the shops. So as maker spaces are getting more popular right now, you might go into a coffee shop and see, you know, the little coffee sleeves that yeah. you can pop in the little coffee cup. And there's like, mm -hmm. usually it's the coffee company's branding on the outside of it. But I'm starting to see more where there's also a mini little library logo, like a little like a little band around the bottom with the library logo or a band around the bottom that says come to your local library or we partnered with the library for such and such yeah totally work with any any stores in your in your town yeah no yeah. and so vista print is another place to go for that and there's also there's a mess of stuff you can do with that laser cut your own coasters and honestly, they're also finding out that it's cheaper to outsource laser cutting and 3D printing than it is to operate and maintain your own laser cutter. So if you don't have one, you can also outsource it. Uh, my dad found out that he can get his entire laser cutting project done for 35 cents a piece um, through a shop on Etsy. And yeah. they just, you send them a design, they do it, and then mail it over to you. And that's how he's actually gotten all of his stuff done and more libraries are doing that too hmm. so if you use a laser cutter a whole ton grab one they're fun they're awesome but if you don't have the time to maintain it or the money to get it outsource hmm. it it's not a problem you can hmm. also outsource some 3d printing projects so if you want to um, 3d printing is not something that you actually want to use to manufacture things in bulk um, that's kind of a common misperception or a misconception. Um, that's not what 3D printing is for. 3D printing is actually for prototyping ideas. Mm -hmm. It's for One testing. Shot. Yeah. Yeah, it, the, unfortunately, that's, yeah. It's but, not like it is in the movies yet. <laughs> yeah. And so that's kind of, if you actually are looking to print a whole mess of things, outsource it or make one thing and then go through the manufacturing process to get it mass manufactured because that's an entirely different process. I wish more people knew that, but I digress. 
you know, those are companies you can have that can produce this, but you can do the design yourself yeah. using things like Canva and all these free resources, which is, I think that's a great thing to promote. I mean, we push Canva all the time and, and things like, yeah. you know, Pixabay or Unsplash for free, um, uh, legally free photos that you can get online to do things if you don't have your own pictures you're taking um you can use and you, you saw the things that that amanda made here you don't have to be a graphic designer to do no, this it, not it, at it, all it you through it and make some really awesome professional looking things um yeah. you know, use these free resources design it and then have a company to print you out 50 of the flyers or whatever yeah. and or make, the buttons, make the yeah what I'm doing right now is I am grabbing a series of free to use image websites that I found and copyright guidelines. Mm. So I'm going to send you over a link to, it's actually in my digital literacy guidebook. I kind of scraped it all together right there. So why not? But it'll show you how to legally use images and media um, it gives resources on things like Pixabay and Upsplash and the higher quality websites that have free to use websites and how to double check the copyright information to make sure you can actually use it. You'll learn the difference between commercial and non-commercial use so that you don't eventually get in one of those messy emails saying, <laughs> you can't do that. So, so in the chat, there'll be a copyright and free image resources yeah and that's something very important to understand which i think some people don't just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's free to use yeah uh copyright and ownership still exists um out there just because you found some picture online doesn't mean you can just grab it and and use it for what you want um look and luckily now we have all of these places like pixabay yeah. and elsewhere that where photographers and artists and whoever are purposefully posting things that they have created that you can use they're saying yes i've made this for public use so go to these places look for them those places yeah. to find things so you don't get caught up in any sort of legal issues yeah we don't want that to happen anybody and your magical phrasing is free for commercial use, no attribution required. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of like your magic free for all awesomeness. Yep. And that is why I heart Pixabay, because mm -hmm. it will clearly label everything. And nine times out of 10, this is what it is. Yep. And you will also want to look for open source videos. So if you are putting together videos and different um, marketing materials like that, there are a variety of places where you can get that for free and you don't have to do the extra work and you can still spice up your library videos without. Video and music, yeah. same thing, same concept. You need to find the free for commercial use. Don't use copyrighted. Don't yeah. use, oh, don't use part of a Beatles song or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and while you may not be putting a frog into your library video, it is my favorite animal, so it is my go-to. But so you can grab one of these, download it, and there's usually different pixel sizes to put this together. So this is one of the quickest, easiest ways that I've found to start making your own videos in the library is just by downloading one of these, going into Canvas Video Editor, adding in some text and graphics, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Pop to it. You can see here what's nice. I like this. If you at least this popped up, say thanks to the video author. And this is for the yeah. pictures and things yeah. too. Uh, crediting isn't required, but linking back is greatly appreciated. So if you do have the ability to somewhere put in a little site, something that says where you got it yeah. from, they will also give you that little here. Just grab this quickie link if you're using it in a presentation or on your website or in something. Um, and at least to let other people know that this particular artist exists and that's where um, you got it from. And one of the easiest ways to do that, and I'm hoping that I have the video still loaded in here. I might. 
but you can add like a little credit slide at the end of your video that says this is where I got these images from that's and that's one of the people doing that on videos yeah. or presentations just one you know, don't have to do it on each thing that you use just at the end have one whole list of here's where everything came from and I may have already exported that video but just like the credits it's on a really it's, it's an, an easy movie, thing you do the same thing yeah credit where you grabbed all the different graphics or clips and or songs or whatever pretty much yeah. and it just it's way easier to just do it that way mm -hmm. oh i know it's because in it's in my other canva account that's why i can't find it that this explains everything <laughs> All right, so now let me go into I will also share out this guide here. Uh, what you will probably find most helpful in here is go into the video styles and click through these links to find out how to do these various different video formats. And it'll just give you some different links to resources and tools and what you actually need to do the video stuff. Um, some people skip over the um, scripting and storyboarding and shoot straight to video styles. Some people shoot straight to video editing, find what you need, grab it, you're good to go. Um, let me grab this. And I will put a it lot in of here. Are, is this also part of your teaching technology page? Are I'm they linking it. On it's that? linked as a resource, okay, but it's yeah. kind of like there's a mess of them. So I just put yeah. this in here because it's one of the. It's a common question. Yeah, there's been yeah, and and yeah, and Amanda's put together so many of these guides. They're really great. I highly recommend using them, going to them. Yep. Um, if anybody has any questions, nobody's typed anything yet in. I just wanted to remind you all, go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface or in the chat. And um, if you want to add any, um, we're not wrapping up or anything just yet, um, but I just wanted to remind you, um, if you have any questions about marketing or using any of these resources or how to do something, or if you've had trouble with something, you want to know how maybe, maybe you could have done it better, um, go ahead and um, go ahead and type in and let us know. Um, or if you have a success that you want to share, how you did something really well, um, had a good marketing experience in the end. Yeah, always love to hear those. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Let me clear out some tabs here just to clean some stuff up here, and I will show you what the course looks as is. I put in the table as I have it right now, just in case you want to start perusing what's available. And this will be updated as soon as I hit save on my new updates. But these are the resources that are available now. I still have to add in cell border lines, so like my styling, but it's still pretty clear which one goes to what so far. And so the video production guide is here. I really, really need to add those lines in, but that's just one line of code. We'll be fine. And so I am up through here right now. So I just have these left to add in, and then we should be good to go until I think of more. <laughs> All right, so it is 10.53, so let me pop over into evaluation because I've talked enough about marketing for right now. Um, there'll be a mess more stuff on that resource page once I've got it added in. Um, you might want to start looking at some of these additional resources just for Graphic Design 101, just so you know that you're going in the right direction or you want to defuglify things then that's just kind of a good way to do it. And if you are wondering about different font sizing rules and kind of like best practices guide for setting things up on the web, this is kind of like a quick reference guide. And in terms of defuglification, there's also the color palette. I know I've shown you this before. It's a color generator. 
you just open up the website, click color generator, and you can hit the space bar till you find the combination of colors that you like. So in terms of evaluation, I'm actually these are some of the main resources that I have pulled from, so I link to them directly. What I'm going to go into right now is projectoutcome.org. So Project Outcome it actually came out of the Public Library Association. It was this giant project that they're working on. And they actually have kind of quick start tools for public and academic libraries. So these tools become available with a sign up. So it is free to sign up. You just get an account and it will start giving you access to these different tutorials. And if you notice, there's one for public and one for academic. They do. Yep. Uh, separate them out and do them a little differently. And Project Outcome did, um, yeah, this is their marketing one, they did just uh, also more in-depth things specifically for those types of libraries as well. So I'm gonna log into my account here and I'll pop you into, so this is what your main login section is going to look like. It'll go into, when you start using their survey tool, they have a tool in there that will let you, it's basically like a quick start to make evaluation surveys for different projects. They have different examples in there and then it'll start managing your surveys within the platform itself. Um, these are some that I just tested out. There are no responses in it because I just wanted to see what it looked like. But they also have a set of tutorials and training guides. So this is kind of your number one resource to head over to when you're first starting to navigate this resource and starting to kind of understand Evaluation 101. So Evaluation 101 is essentially what are the different tools, processes, and methods that I need to do to make sure that what I did works. So this is where it starts to get a little it can get really straightforward or a touch murky because <laughs> as with anything. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly because a lot of these evaluation tools, they're starting to incorporate more of the user experience, the resources and models. So let me go in here, here. So this is the one that I like to use just because I lean more toward user experience research. This is usability.gov. This talks about the different resources that mesh and flow together with the user experience resources and user experience research tools that I've used throughout teaching tech. So these are the different methods that I'm just more familiar with. Um, not all of them came from the library world, but they are effective. So you'll see a lot of these reflected in what's been used throughout the course. There are also kind of quick start guides for using these. So it's up to you as to what works better for you and if you want to mix and match. Um, in terms of reviewing these different resources, the Public Library Association is clearly and definitely geared toward libraries you likely will not have to do in a lot of extra additional work to be able to adapt the resources over to your own library. And they'll also have a lot more quick start templates and a lot more grab and go survey options. So this is a, it's an awesome resource. It is, they mm -hmm. have like, they have what you need to know. And they'll also be able to curate and manage the resources that you choose to use within here. So this one, awesome, delightful, try it. And also dig into their data collection option if you are trying to make um, data-informed decisions and trying to just make sure you're going in the right direction. And so in terms of comparison, these are more tools that you would actually have to adapt to what you are doing. They flow into what I've already talked about in terms of user experience. And they are, some of them are more, are more creative, some of them are more off the wall, some of them are just, focus groups are everywhere. Focus groups have been around since the dawn of time. Um, 
wireframe testing is newer if you want to test um, how well your website is doing. And so if you want to test out how well people are interacting with your own website, how well they're interacting with your user interface, how well they're interacting with any web-based resources, I recommend usability.gov over PLA. Um, I may not have gotten to the section of PLA that talks about websites specifically, but from what I've seen so far, usability.gov has more for that. And user experience research has a lot more for it, like beginner, intermediate, advanced web testing. And so the first click testing, wireframe, card sorting, and focus groups on this page are geared more toward websites. And PLA, their surveys are usually geared more toward programming and in-person events. So that's kind of your comparison side-by-side -side evaluation when you're choosing which one of these tools you actually want to use. And for all I know, Public Library Association has added more stuff since I looked at it the last time. Maybe they started doing more for websites, but... Yeah, I mean, the project outcome has been around for a long time. Yeah, and yeah. I, when, uh, I can't even remember. We've done Encompass Lives about it specifically for just the public library and academic library, and they just keep coming up with new things like this yeah. about evaluation. Yeah. So it's, it's like an ongoing project. So there's always going to be yeah. something new in there, I think. Yeah. And there's always a different tool for the thing that you're actually trying to do. So in person, so? yeah. In person programming, library land, library friendly. PLA, mm -hmm. website, digital tools, um, whatever newfangled term you want to call it, usability evaluation. And these other ones on here are more specific to libraries directly. Um, I have other resources that I use that are just in my personal toolbox that are not personally like library specific, they're just web specific. So if you want those, I can give them to you. I just chose like a little curated collection that seems to be useful so far. And it is 11.01 right now. And I know that we did start a little bit late, but I did say that I was going to abbreviate a few things. <laughs> So I'll pause, see if there are any questions at the moment. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, um, we'll, um, we won't, we don't get cut off just because we've hit 11 or anything. Um, you can ask any questions you have, Amanda, uh, about marketing, promotion, um, how to create any of these things that she's showing you. If you want to see any more detail about using anything, go ahead and type in and ask. Yeah. And I'm going to take a sip, let you think about it. And Is then wondering about or wanted to hear about today that you haven't yet. Or any tips you might have for people, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, any success stories of your own with marketing, what worked for you, what didn't work. We can learn, we learn from our uh, failures. Those are all, all yeah. just important. <laughs> I can't see if you're typing, so I have to wait to see if you finish it. So. That's <laughs> why I took the sip, because... Yeah, coming up. Um, <laughs> did we want to also talk about, I know you still got something about the teaching technology library course that these um, Encompass Lives have been more, uh, have been kind of about the full course. Yeah. And, you know, after you finish wrapping up what you're talking about today, but... Yeah. All right, so... Since I am just going to do kind of a somewhat abbreviated version of this, the last thing I'm going to open up is this link over here. So if you kind of want to get a basic understanding of, I don't have a whole ton of time to run into evaluation, and I just kind of want a quick thing that I want to start doing right now, this article from Demco is the place to go. So this is kind of the quick touch on the most important things that you actually need to know to find out, did this thing work? And so the other platforms on here, they're going to make you read a little bit. But this one here is kind of like your 
in a nutshell thing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a good place to start just to learn the basics and understand the formatting of what evaluation is going to look like, what to look for, and how to get it done. So that is kind of the quickie guide mostly because I didn't get a chance to put together one of my handy dandy infographics that puts together the process of evaluation, but everything in time. All right, so I'm going to pop back over into the teaching technology course. And I'll just go over, since this is the last series in the webinar, I'll give you kind of a series of what's coming up next with this because I'll be adding things, changing things, and as I get feedback from what has worked, what hasn't, this is what's going to shift around. Um, I'm going to start over with the first module here. The first thing I'm looking at is formatting. So right now, all of this is in one long chunker. Like it's in, it's a big thing. So I'm adding, page and next buttons. So this is the user interface and navigation. So I talked about the usability testing. This is what it looks like when you actually use the usability testing. Um, when people interact with these pages, they want things that have a, it's more graphic heavy. It has a related graphic that kind of pulls on what the content is and what matters and but it also isn't like a massive long chunk of text it's broken up into bitty sections so this will actually not be on the first page so from user experience 101 there'll be a next button or in a user experience 101 button that you just click to the next navigation and then it shifts over to this page and it gets chunked out so that people aren't, it's, this is based on cognitive overload. Mm -hmm. When people start seeing this entire page all together, all at once, it's, it's hard, yeah, it's overwhelming. It's hard to mentally break the information down into chunks yourself. I talk about chunking in here and I talk about kind of cognitive overload best practices, best practices. And that is one of them, is people don't naturally chunk information so that it's regulated for themselves. And that's why when people see a lot of those library websites that have all the different content all in one long string, the, the brain just shuts down. And then when you go into places like edX, they have a different format. Um, let me see if I can sign into my edX or if my password is not saved on here. Uh, I saved it on my home computer, not here. I don't remember my password, but the navigation is different. It has quick start buttons that are up here that give a review of the different sections that are available. So you can navigate through the quick start buttons here there's a next button down here that'll let you jump from section to section to section. And there's also more heavy, more image heavy resources. And each one of these lists that are down here are being converted over into the cards. So you'll start to see that shift over. I've done several already. And many of the paragraphs are going to be replaced by an image. This used to be two paragraphs. It's now one image. Nice. And there's also more download links that will be incorporated above each image because sometimes the font is just too small for people to read and mm -hmm. you need the larger version of it. And that's more of an accessibility thing than anything else. And so that is probably the biggest thing that you'll actually want to start looking into. And I have more of a more graphic design things that are coming up on here. But this is this whole web series is just kind of an example of how these courses actually evolve over time and a realistic 
layout and format and step series for how this will look. And it's how I'm doing it now and how your library may be doing it in the future. So I'm going to hit the escape key. I'm going to go back in here and I will open up this one here. And this is my incremental course update. So if you want a written list of kind of what is actually going to be coming up, mm -hmm. it's in here. Uh, the full syllabus will probably be done with activities and completed worksheets probably within about a month, I'd say. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is um, very interesting how, how we did this. Um, we've had these four uh, Encompass live shows on teaching tech and these you know, kind of condensed, here's what each section is about, um, but then be able to see how you're creating the class at the same time from yeah. the beginning and what it looked like and what is changing. Um, so seeing live, live and in person, but the actual uh, process of concept and you write out everything in probably these long sentences and paragraphs, because here's everything I need to, the information I need to convey, but I need to make it actually understandable, easier. Yeah. So um, you all, libraries watching, librarians watch this, can see this process happening to use for some of your trainings you may do. Um, see how things change and, and get updated. Yeah. And this, I mean, this series was also kind of an educational experiment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Because some people just want to see the course under the hood. Mm -hmm. So that is pretty much what I'll wrap up with. And we'll see if there are any other questions about this, about the process, about the course itself, what we've covered today. Yeah, go ahead and type in any questions you have. Um, nothing has come in just um, yet, that's fine. Um, the course itself, uh, any, you, know, you were showing it on the website there. Um, you're showing the actual where the course is. Oh, um, let me grab that. If, if you know you're still working on it, is is it available for people to start taking the parts of it, or you want to wait? Yeah. Until you're done? Um, mm -hmm. So you can definitely start using any of the resources and what's available in here. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the only thing I'm actually really adding is um, more or less standardized worksheets. Mm -hmm. So inside each of these sections, right now there's a learn more that'll jump you right over into the section. But underneath this is going to be how to complete this section with immediate links to download the relevant worksheets. So it's basically more of a user experience thing, user interaction, so that you know exactly what the section is and then what is expected of you to be able to complete that section once you're done. So that's basically once you see a little button on here that says worksheet and how to complete, it's done. But as it is now, all the resources that you actually do need, the resources I'm basing the worksheets off of and links to the exist existing worksheets that are there, they do exist. They are available in here. Um, they just haven't been defuglified yet. It's a technical term. You're welcome to use them, but just understand, you know, in a week or two, they might look prettier and be yeah. easier to navigate. And that's, yeah, the content is still there. And to be clear, this is, you know, we're talking about this course. Um, this is not anything that costs anything to go through. Um, this is just free and out there on this, this web page that um, Amanda has put together. Um, there's no cost. There's no uh, registering to use it. You, it's a self uh self-teaching right yeah asynchronous whatever the terminology we're using now um that it's out there for you to use anybody can use it it's not restricted to nebraska um libraries um anybody can go in here and get and access all of this and and go through the the course steps uh to be clear we do not you now a lot of times when people take courses and take classes i like this webinar um for sometimes do it for continuing education credits, um, CE yeah. potentially. If you are a Nebraska librarian doing this and working towards your Nebraska Public Libraries librarian certification, we you can earn, earn, earn CE credits for doing that. 
Um, if you're from another state, we cannot issue C credits to people from other states. It doesn't, the, the C hours doesn't work that way. We're not authorized to do that, but you can reach out to your local continuing education issuing agency, whoever in your state is in charge of that, and point them to these pages and say, so I'm doing this work here. Can I earn CE for, for doing it? Um, and, and see if they will issue you the actual credits for it. You have to talk to your own people. Uh, oh, we do have a comment. Uh, thank you from Vermont. Lots of great resources. And we love Vermont. Yes. <laughs> Sweet. You're welcome. We hope it's helpful. And, and you know, spread the word to all your colleagues or any librarians in your state who you think might um, want to learn about this. Yeah. And for CE credit in the state, these will be piecemealed because not everybody actually wants to run through the whole gamut of this, but you yeah. can get sort of you can get CE credit for just doing the exercises for figuring out what problems people are facing or do CE credit for mapping out resources or mapping out mm -hmm. partners. Right. So there's not like you have to do the whole thing and then you get all your CE. You can just do one part. Um here in Nebraska we do it, you know, down to I think the half an hour, 20 minutes of doing work or something. Um, you can get a half a CE for that. Uh, so you can do these things and just do the parts you want, submit just those little bits and pieces and yeah, get yeah. CE, those little CEs that build up through those. Yeah. So if your partnerships are awesome, but your marketing needs work, pick just what you need. Yeah. yeah. All right, it doesn't look like we have any other desperate questions coming in, so I think maybe we will wrap it up. Is that cool? Yeah, All sounds right. like a plan. All right, <clears throat> so thank you everybody for being here today. I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen. There we go. And there's speaking of Facebook, there's our Facebook page. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live for those of you who like to use Facebook. <laughs> um, that we do post reminders here. Here's your reminder to log into today's show. Um, advertisement for the ARSL conference coming up. Last week's recording being available. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. Um, if you like to use other social media, we do post on to Twitter and our, our social media people do things on Instagram and I can't remember what else. Um, we use this hashtag NCUMPLIVE, a little abbreviation there, so look for that anywhere if you're interested in what we're doing. Um, this is the session page for today's show. As I said, we have the recordings for the previous three. Um, we will then have this recording will go up as well and on each of their pages it will be linked to so you'll be able to get all the recordings for all these Encompass, the four Encompass Lives that we've done um, in this series. And I'm going to pop over to our main Encompass Live page here. Um, so here you can see we've got a link to our Facebook page there, links to our Facebook pages in each of these sessions. Um, these are upcoming shows, but right underneath here is a link to the archived Encompass Live shows. That's where you can go to get all of our recordings. Today's show will be at the top of the list here, the most recent ones at the top. Everybody who um, attended today and registered for today's show will get an email directly from me letting you know when it's available. Uh, usually by the end of the day tomorrow, should be everything should be up as long as uh, YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me. I'll let you all know. And we'll push it out on our various social media as well. Um, we'll have a link to the show recording, a link to the slides, which I've just got open here for my reference. Uh, some of the other things that we've been talking about today that um, Amanda shared, there's the teaching technology, the library course, uh, digital literacy guidebook. So this is all part of pages that she has on our site. Um, all of that will be included as well. Uh, while we're here on the archive page, I'll show you there is a search feature here. If you want to look through our arch show archives and see if there's been a show on some topic you might be interested in, um, you can do a search. You can search the full archives or you can limit it to just the most recent 12 months if you want something really current. Um, and that is because, and I'll show you here, um, this is the full archives for the Encompass Live show. We premiered in January 2009. So there's 
where are we at now? 10, 11, 12 years worth of archives of show available. And we have all of them here on this one page. It's a long, long page, yes, a lot to scroll through, but use the search look you know, to find a topic you might be interested in. But when you do watch something, just pay attention to the original broadcast date and what the content of that particular show is. Um, some, some things may stand the test of time, book reviews, things like that, but um, some things may become outdated. Um, information may be old, links may be broken, resources may have changed drastically um, or might no longer exist anymore from 10 years ago. Um, so just pay attention when you are watching something to what the original um, public uh, broadcast date was. They're all dated, so you'll know that. But uh, we will always keep these all up here, as librarians do. We keep things for historical purpose sometimes and um, make sure that they are available. And we'll always have these available as long as we have somewhere to host them. All right, back to the main page here. So um, that will wrap it up for today's show. Next week, we are going to be talking about, um, here's our upcoming shows. You can see we've got August booked in. I do have some dates. I uh, started filling in September and October, and I've got some other shows to be um, that will come up in here, so keep your eye on our schedule. You'll notice this one October one, um, No Encompass Live. Once a year, we do take a break from the show, and it is the week of our Nebraska Library Association Conference. So that is the week of, um, of Wednesday, October 13th. The conference is that um, couple of days of that week, the 12th to the 14th. Um, but we always take that day off because people are more interested, you know, going to conference. So um, if you're a Nebraska library, register. I did just see yesterday, I think they opened up registration for our Nebraska Library Association conference. Um, there's going to be two virtual days and a in-person day. So you have your option there. So um, we won't be here for Encompass Live. We'll be doing something with a conference. Um, but you can register for any of your other shows. Next week, we're going to be talking about small libraries will save the world. Yay. Oops. Yay. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, implementing sustainability at the library. Um, April Griffith, who is from um, Eureka Springs, Arkansas Library, will be with us to talk about how um, we can do that as libraries, how we can help. So definitely register for that one and any of our other upcoming shows and keep an eye on our schedule for when I add more. Other than that, thank you everybody for being here with us. Thank you, Amanda. Um, you get to take a month off now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! And with us, it is great. Thank you so much for doing this teaching technology courses like every couple of weeks. Um, usually she just does a once a month with us the last Friday of the month. As you can see here, I've got the pretty sweet text blocked out for August and September. So um, we'll see what you come up with for August. Uh, I know you're wrapping up what we're doing today, so um, keep your eyes open to see what kind of text she'll be sharing with us at the end of August. It will be tech-tastic. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you in a future Encompass Live. Bye-bye.